When we're dealing with equilibrium problems, we often need to know or understand where the center of mass is to figure out where is the force of gravity and how is it going to cause torque to cause some rotation. So let's talk a little bit about the center of mass. Um, when you are talking about the center of mass, when you find it, you can consider that all of the mass is located there when you're doing a subsequent calculation. Um, if you want to find it, like if you take a stick and you throw it, you'll see that the stick itself is going to rotate around the center of mass. When you want to find it mathematically, you want to sum up the product of the mass, the position of each particle, and then divide by its total mass. And I have a formula for it in a minute. Conceptually, that's kind of hard to think about. It's a lot easier if you understand sort of calculus summation. So we'll just show it to you and have you kind of understand what it does. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it very uh, anecdotally, I guess. For regularly shaped objects, the center of mass is a geometric, geometric center of the object. And that's what you had to know the most. That's the most important. You know, we're generally going to be talking about symmetric things. So if you have a, a, a beam of some sort, then we're going to understand that the center of mass is just in the center of it. So we like symmetric objects for that case. And in this class, when we do problems, they'll generally have um, the, the be a nice symmetric shape. But it's kind of cool. If you think of some objects, the center of mass itself you know, if you're summing up all of the mass and then dividing by the total mass, um, it actually can be at a place where there's no mass at all. So inside a big tub, uh, the center of gravity is inside the center. In this chair, it's below the chair for this cup, inside the cup. And then if you have a boomerang, the total center of mass is actually outside the boomerang. Now, if you were to throw a wrench, for example, you're going to see that uh, the 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 trajectory of the object itself is going to follow a parabolic trajectory. But the wrench, as it's flying through the air, is going to be rotating around and around its center of mass. Now, kind of need to look at this. Check out, check out where the center of mass is. Think about why that mass is located where it is. Um, we talked about the product of a chunk of mass, here's a chunk of mass, times the distance it is away from, well, in this case, the center. But that mass times that distance, and if we take, I'll call it x instead of d, that mass times, and I'm going to say m sub i, times that distance. That's the product of the mass distance. It's sort of like a lever arm, right? It's going to cause this thing to tend to want to rotate. And then you add that to this mass times that distance, and this mass times this distance, and then you take these masses times that distance, and you add them all up. And when you add up every single one, all of these masses times each of these distances, and divide by the total mass. So if you take a summation of all of the masses times each of the distances, and you divide by the total mass, you're going to be left with just a distance in meters. And that is the location of your center of mass. So that's the kind of mathematical operation you do it. Now, what, how is that important? Well, if, if your mass out here, that's going to be more important in affecting where the center of mass is because it's so much further away. So that mass is going to have a larger effect on where the center of mass is than something that is closer. That's it. Okay, and then now, uh, the, this little, when you're driving off a diving board, think about this, right? If you go running up and you jump off a diving board and you spring off into the air, your trajectory of your center of mass, which is your belly button, pretty much, okay, the trajectory is going to be in a parabola. But you can spin and twist and shake around, but that will all happen around the center of mass. The center of mass itself is going to follow the parabolic trajectory. So these are a couple of interesting ways you can use to calculate the center of mass. Mathematically speaking, it looks like this over here, where I, which I just showed you, which is where take every little chunk of mass times its distance. And you could do it from any point. So you could say, what is this little mass distance? And times, and we'll say, well, we want to take the center of mass around here. And then once we get, we figure out that distance, all the little masses times each of those little distances, we can find where the center of mass is located. Um, so mathematically speaking, if you can set up a formula 
you could solve it that way, that turns out to be just an integral calculus relationship. So if you have a formula, you could solve it using integration. Um, in class, if you have a weird shape, this is kind of a couple interesting little techniques. It's kind of fun. Oops, that's supposed to be my eraser. If you have uh, the United States and you want to say, oh, where's the center of mass of the United States? You do what's called a plumbob method, which is where you punch a little hole and then you make a line, like you fill, put your chalk on your, on your plumb barb. The plumb barb is just something that falls straight down and points in the direction of the gravitational force. So you're going to get a line like here. And then if you hang it from this hole over here, it's going to point this way when it's vertical, right? And if you point it over here, it's going to be hanging down. It's going to point that way. And so if you have three different positions, then where they intersect is going to be your center mass. That's kind of slick. You can do that with any weird shape if you want to find the center of mass. So they're doing the same thing here with this, this funny arrow. You know, first I go here, and I get this line, whoosh, which is right there. And then I will go here, and I get this line. Whoosh. And so now I know that this, if I do a third one, whoosh, comes right down. All three of those lines are going to cross in the center of mass. So cool little trick if you ever want to find one. OK. Here's a little baseball trick. If you, uh, if you grab a baseball bat, and you put your hands and you locate them on the outside. So you put one hand here and you put one hand here. So you're balancing the bat so it's not going to tip over. And then if you slowly, gradually move your hands to the middle and you do it really slowly and then you put your hands together, you're going to end up exactly below the center of mass of the bat. So there is the center of the mass, right there. Let's find it right there. That's also called the sweet spot. So if you hit the ball, right at that center of mass, it feels really good. You don't have any kind of a twang feeling. If you hit it out here at the end of the bat, it's not going to have uh, be as quite a good of a hit. Or if you hit it inside here, it's going to feel weird. You're going to feel like a vibration on your bat because it's not at the center of mass. Now, it's really useful if you're doing a problem where we talked about where you have like a beam and it's in a corner and you're going to drop this thing. And you say, well, first of all, what's it going to do? Well, what you know it's going to do is it's going to fall. It's going to come down this way. There is a torque acting to cause this thing to rotate around the corner. The corner is pinned, and so it's going to fall down. How do you figure out how fast it's going to fall down? Well, you say, well, let's just imagine that all of the mass is located right here at the center. And then you know this force. You put all of the force, the mg there, and then you figure out what is the lever arm. Okay, and the lever arm in this case is going to be halfway up the rod. So whatever that distance, if it's a one meter rod, then that distance is going to be 0.5 meters. So to get the torque, you just take this force times this lever arm and multiply, don't forget, by the sine of the angle between it. Boom. And that will tell you how much torque it is. And that torque is going to change as the thing rotates, but it's kind of cool. You can figure out what it is at that one moment in time. Okay. If you have a plunger and you cut it through the center mass, which piece, if any, has the greater center, I'm sorry, the greater mass? So plunger is like um, the kind that you use to unclog your toilet, right? It looks like this, and then it kind of comes around like that and has like a little bell shaped at the bottom. The question is, if you find the center of mass and it happens to be right about there and you cut it, um, which of these ends is going to have more mass? That's a little question to think about. I'm not going to answer it for you right now because you're going to see a demo on it and then you can figure it out then. So take a stab though. What do you think it is? Do you think it is the handle? Or do you think it's the plunger? Or do you think they're equal? Good question. Try to figure it out. Okay. Torque in the center of gravity. You might have noticed when you're standing up that if you lean over to one side, it causes you to tip over. Why is that? Well, let's look at a little, little example here. What we have is a box, and the box is located on a ramp, and we can lift this thing up. Now, here is the center of gravity, or the center of mass, and I've got a plumb bob to show what direction that force pulling down on this object is. So, this first case, we would say this is stable, because take a look at the force. The force is in this way. And the, the hinge point, right, the, thing, the point around which this thing is going to tip, right, it's going to roll over that corner right there. Does that make sense? That's like a little hinge. But the force right now is pulling it back. So if there's any kind of torque, it's putting it back where it belongs. So this thing starts to tip. Nope, the gravity force pulls it back. 
Right here, however, now we are at this really critical point because the force is down and the hinge is right here. So as long as the force is to the right, on this side, it's going to cause it to stay put. Imagine this thing is, is staying on because there's friction, okay? But if you go beyond and you get a force that goes out this way, now you're outside that hinge, now you're going to cause the thing to fall down. So if you li lift up that ramp just a little bit more, now the center of gravity is outside the fringe point, boom, and it causes it to timber, tip over. Some neat familiar objects, uh, we've shown them that leaning power of Pisa a couple of different times. So what you can see here is that the center mass of the leaning power of Pisa is right here, right? And as it's leaning, its gravitational force is right here. The hinge point over which it would tip is right there. Do you see how the gravity force is to the right? So it tends to cause it to rotate this way, which is good and safe. It doesn't tip it over. But what would happen if you filled up with lots and lots of people? up here on the edge, and they're all looking out of the edge. Oh, what a preview. And you put a whole bunch of mass up here. Then your center of mass is going to shift, and it looks something like this. And then it starts to feel a little tippy, a little scary, right? That thing could tip over. So for a long time, they actually banned people from the top of the tower in the Leaning Tower of Pisa because they were worried about this very event, that you would get too much mass. It would cause the thing to tip over, become unstable, and timber. What they have done instead uh, of Well, they did close it, but then what they've done since then is they have restructured the foundation of the Leaning Tower. So now it actually comes way out here, and they've locked it in um, underneath, right, um, so that this thing is not going anywhere. They excavated and re-foundationed the whole thing, making it really safe. It's never going to tip over, and so now you can fill it up with lots of people on the top, and it's not going to tip over. It might raise a question, if they were going to go ahead and fix the foundation, why didn't they just straighten out the tower. They didn't. Um, this fun little party toy over here, you get a cork and a couple forks, and you, you put the, the um, toothpick in there, and you can actually get the thing balancing. It looks like it would tip over. Why doesn't it? Well, if you think about it, all this mass on these forks is way over here, so you've got an equal balance of force, I'm sorry, of an mg force out here with the mg force over here, so we'd say the center of mass is actually right there for the whole cool little toy. Pretty slick. Same thing is happening here, right? You have seen this one, of, one of these funny little tippy toys. You have a little eagle, and it balances, and you would think, oh, it should fall over this way, but it doesn't. And why doesn't it? Because they put lots of mass at the edge on these tips of these wings. And so the center of mass of this thing, remember it's the force times the distance divided by the total, I'm sorry, the, the mg force times the distance, delta m, times the distance from the center of mass. Okay, that distance. Whoop. Add them all up, divide by the total mass. Um, you have so much mass out here kind of far away that it balances the mass that you have along the rest of the bird, making the center mass right there. And so it balances beautifully. Okay, equilibrium. We talk about unstable versus stable. Equilibrium means it's staying put. It's right there, and it's hanging out, and it's not going anywhere. Some of the force is zero, some of the torques is zero. And you can have stable equilibrium and unstable. When you have, by definition, unstable equilibrium, that means that if you were to give this thing a little push off to the side, or you give this thing a little push off to the side, what's it going to do? Woo! It's going to go down the hill. Or it's going to, woo, come around and tip over. A stable equilibrium means that if you push it off to one side, it is going to go right back to where it belongs. If you push it off to one side, it's going to go right back to where it belongs. So we say that these are stable equilibrium. Also, in engineering, you can imagine we do as much stable engineering as we possibly can. A neutral equilibrium means if you push it one way, it doesn't go tipping off, it doesn't go the other, back to where it belongs, it just stays wherever you pushed it. So we would call that as a neutral equilibrium. Have you ever seen a guy on, or gal, on a tightrope? This is a cool picture of someone um, doing a tightrope over Niagara Falls. They have um, improved their stability by using this great big long pole. And we're going to talk about moments of inertia soon, but uh, by having this big long pole, it's a lot harder to cause this person to rotate back or, or forth. That's really good. That makes them very stable. It makes it a lot harder for them to tip over. The other thing they do, though, that's really important that people might not realize is they put a lot of mass at the 
ends of these guys, so out here and out here. And if you have the person standing, right, like this, oh, I should put, probably put their feet, if they're standing on the wire like this, okay, and they're holding that, that long beam, what, what they actually do is they have this thing get so low and they put mass out here that they try to create it so that here, if there's, here's the tightrope they're walking on, they try to create it so that the center of mass is actually right about at or below the wire itself. And that makes it a more stable type of equilibrium. So the more mass they can get on that outer edge of the pole, the more stable um, their walking environment. Now, just because they're stable doesn't mean you couldn't slip and trip and say goodbye and you're going down off the, off the high wire. But they're much more stable with those great big poles. Ever notice when you're carrying a big bucket that's heavy that you take your arm out and you stick it out there? Why would you do that? Think about how by having a bucket that's heavy and holding it, you have moved normally your center mass is at your belly button. But by holding that bucket, you've just shifted the center of mass over. And so you feel like, ah, I'm going to tip over, right? You're going to tip right over your foot like that. It's going to create a force. It goes over your torque. So what do you do? You take your arm and you lift it away from your body. By lifting your arm away, you are putting little chunks of mass further away from the center or further away from the center here. Okay, by putting it further away, you are moving your center of mass back towards the center, which is what you want. So a lot of times if you're walking along, right, and you are carrying two buckets, right, you have a bucket here and you have a bucket here, and someone says, oh, let me carry that bucket for you. You say, ah, no thanks, I'm balanced, actually, and you are. So you don't want to give up one bucket because then it would cause you to tip over one way. But if you have one on either side, your center of mass is right in your middle, and you feel good, even though your arms get tired. At least you don't tip over. Okay, we've got a bunch of fun demos in class. We'll take a look at those. And a bunch of little fun competitions, battle of the sexes, because men and women are built differently. So we have different skills when it comes to our centers of mass, and we'll play with those in class as well.